Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to the Great Books series, uh, both for the Wisdom School and for undergraduates at Ubiquity University. We are now completing our fall trimester uh, with two months on the oldest book to which there's attached a specific author, a woman uh, who lived 2300 years BC uh, in Hejuana, who was the daughter of Sargon the Great, who as far as we know was the first king to establish an empire in ancient Mesopotamia. And so we're delighted to be able to celebrate uh, this first known work uh, that we can identify an author, a woman, daughter of a great king. And we're very privileged today to have one of our own alumni and doctoral students, Karen Castle, uh, to uh, share her thoughts on uh, in Hejuana and the celebration that Enhejuana made of the goddess Inanna. I am particularly pleased to introduce Karen. Um, I was at her first intensive uh, some years ago. I can't remember what year it was actually, uh, Karen. And as I normally do, I always like to meet with the new students for lunch on the first or second day. And, and she identified her interest in these matters and into the epic of Gilgamesh and I got very animated um, because uh, the epic of Gilgamesh has been a, a source of both uh, inspiration for me and great study for me for many, many years. Um, I believe that the epic of Gilgamesh uh, is really the classic text on the contradictions and the tragedy of civilization. And what struck me about Karen uh, is that she very early on felt that uh, there was an answer to the dilemma of Gilgamesh. And that began uh, several years of, of dialogue between us and I ended up being her content advisor uh, for her dissertation and ended up being along with Will and Georgie and others um, on her uh, oral exam and she passed with flying colors and and uh, she herself has written a number of books on Inanna um, and so the the relationship between Gilgamesh and Inanna uh, is an important subtext that I think will arise over the course of this lecture and our final lecture of the year in December but Karen I I really want to welcome you and uh, turn the floor now over to your remarks on this great work of literature. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. And greetings, everyone. Nice to see everybody. Uh, I am very excited to give this presentation on Inanna and, and Hedjuana. And I um, just uh, really looking forward to it. I'm always, any chance I get, I can speak on Inanna, it is a privilege for me. So, um, a couple of things. I just, Jim, it was back in 2011 uh, when I first started with Wisdom Graduate School. And prior to that, though, I had worked a lot with Inanna. I had already written my first book. And um, what I want to do today is give you an idea of my background with Inanna, talk a little bit about Enhejuana, just give a, a brief, you already gave somewhat, but a little bit more on her writings and her uh, devotion to Inanna, and then move into the story of Inanna because really that is important to understand where Enhejuana was coming from with her devotion, connection, and, and all of her very extensive writings, which became then her to be known as the first author that we know of today in history. 
So it's very exciting to be presenting on her as well. Um, so I just want to share because I have quite a different diverse background. I, I have experience with, um, I'm an acupuncturist and I've done a lot of work with transpersonal psychology and I, uh, all of this came together for me in the beginning of the 2000 millennia. So I also, I was very interested in many different things and I decided to work with holotropic breath work. And what happened for me is uh, after a couple of sessions of holotropic breath work, I had this powerful experience that I still it has not left me in, in any way. I can remember it vividly. And I'll just give you a brief on it and highlight what happened. But it was a feeling. I was, if, if you've never done holotropic breath work, it's basically laying with your eyes closed, doing deep breathing, uh, profound music is playing, and the idea is to go into an altered state of consciousness. So I had done it a couple of times, but I was in a big room with a couple of hundred people and Dr. Stan Groff was there and the experience uh, that came to me was I was in a very dark place. I was, uh, it was pitch black and, and I wouldn't know this terminology at the time, but later to be thinking of it as uh, the underworld. So it was very, very dark. And then I sensed that there was a box or a sarcophagus in front of me. And in my mind, I hear a voice telling me to open the box. And I think, I'm already scared. I want to open a box and see what's going to come out. But then at the same time, I knew, and I even had to tell myself really that this is only holotropic breath work. You can open your eyes. It's okay. So I proceed to open the box. And from there comes this purple cloud-like hue of energy that just envelops me completely. And then I'm lifted up into the light and I'm lifted up and I'm floating and I'm just feeling this blissful, uh, almost ecstatic kind of sensation in my body. And as I said, I had already had a couple of the holotropic breathwork sessions, so I had already had some experience with this um, energetic entity, it felt like. And I said, who are you? Because I, I, at this point, wanted to know, what, who are you? What is this? And I heard in my mind, Ainanya. So I spelled it, and I spelled it A-Y-N-A-N-Y-A, but... Uh, Later, I would come to know that it's Inanna, the goddess of queen in heaven and earth. And once I uh, worked with some of the material online, fortunately, so that was back in 2002, 2003, and I could find some information on Inanna, it was not much really at all, but I did find, and I happened to find this particular book, uh, Inanna, Queen of Heaven and Earth, who was written by uh, Samuel Noah Kramer and Diane Wolkstein. And I went on over years later to explain this, this red book as my Bible. It became my second Bible but because I studied it thoroughly. And then uh, over years, continued to research and delve into it more and more and more, and uh, read of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and had that's my experience with uh, Gilgamesh that that Jim was talking about, because I remember reading that, and his uh, he and Inanna in the Epic of Gilgamesh have quite a confrontation 
after she makes an advance to him to perform the sacred marriage ritual and he rejects her. So my immediate response was, well, who would do that? Because this sacred marriage ritual was like the ritual of Christmas that we have or Thanksgiving or all these different cultural rituals that have been over the years so embedded in society. And then here's Gilgamesh, uh, so confident and he rejects her. And so they have this big battling of the sexes, so to speak, not really, but the, you know, we can just have fun with it that way. And that is what inspired my dissertation. Um, why did Gilgamesh reject Inanna? So I really have worked a lot with the story and the Sumerian culture and all of the mythology surrounding that. And what came to me was that Inanna was really one of, she was one of the four uh, top deities in the pantheon of the Sumerian culture. And her reign was, uh, it went on for a couple of hundred years uh, where we come into with an Hedjwana. But I felt like she wasn't as well known in our Western civilization and society as she should be. So I began to really feel like I needed to devote some energy towards making her well known. I've written the two books. My first book was Unveiling the Modern Goddess through Symbolism, Chakras, and Myth. And basically highlighting her myth with the symbolism that is in the writings of Ainan, her hymns and the poetry um, that are so uh, universally symbolic that we can draw so much from the symbolism for our own life development. And it was Ainana's life development, her story. Um, and then also interestingly, happens to coincide with my reading of Dr. Jung's Kundalini Yoga, the psychology of Kundalini Yoga, which totally fit everything that I was putting together. So it was really uh, fun and, and just uh, synchronistic in my writing of the first book on Inanna. And then the second book, I felt like I was writing at the same time as the Sacred Union, uh, connecting the masculine and feminine. And I really wanted to highlight the balance of the feminine and masculine energies within every one. So it's connecting those, having awareness of those, and balancing these energies as we move forward in our transformation of humanity towards more of a balance of the energies where in the past we've had more of the patriarchal domination. So uh, I just want to point out from that what I felt was happening to me was a um, experience of having a great deep love for Ainana. And to this day, I still have that. It is just as strong and it's uh, very, very special to me. And I um, am constant, in constant devotion of Inanna. I also have my other uh, gods and deities and archetypes as well, but especially Inanna. So from there, I want to just then move into what I wanted to share about Enhejuana. Um, because she too had this extreme, deep love for Inanna. And when you read the exaltation of Inanna, you really can get that. Um, but she also has other hymns and poems that she wrote that are in this particular book written by uh, Betty Meador. And I think I have this as a reference. It's Inanna. Lady of Largest Heart. 
there are the poems of Anna Juana that were translated uh, from Leonard Woolley's uh, 1930s excavation in, in near Iraq, near Baghdad. Um, but Enhejwana, her life was as a daughter of King Sargon. And he's the great Akkadian king. His, his empire was known throughout Mesopotamia and all of the city-states of that area. And, uh, really a couple hundred years of his reign. And um, so Enhejwana also was pretty much uh, involved in all of the goings on based on his reign and, and the kingdom. And most importantly though, she was the high priestess. So she was responsible for all of the religious, the transactions, the, uh, the I, mean, I meant to say the rituals and the various um, transactions that went on religiously, all the ceremonies and um, all of the temple hymns that she kept sacred in her temple, but were also uh, spread throughout Mesopotamia and based on um, the devotion to Inanna, because Inanna is queen of heaven and earth and goddess of love and warfare and fertility was a big piece in the king's um, dynasty and, and um, protection and obviously um, growth in their, in their future and keeping the, everything stable and continuing to grow. So Inanna had, or Enhejwana had quite a big role to carry this along and she constantly was in uh, continued dialogue and translation or in um, working with uh, Inanna to help her carry this big role that she had. So uh, I'm going to say more about Enhejwana uh, at the end, right, right as I finish. But I want to now move into the story of Inanna as I tell it. And I'm going to omit some of the pieces uh, because it is quite lengthy and uh, really just highlights uh, what is important and pertinent for this discussion and, and the teaching today. In, the, in all cultures that we know of, there is the creation story. And this is also true for the Sumerian culture. And that creation story is the very, very, very beginning of humanity where the gods came together to create human beings in the likeness of themselves, but in a material form. And at some point, apparently they weren't very pleased with their creation and decided to wipe out humanity. So here we have uh, the story of the flood, which is uh, also in many different cultures and we know, especially in the Bible, Noah's Ark and these different things. And uh, in the Sumerian culture, it's uh, Uptanishtim that is the one who the gods co go to, to ask to, create pairs of, uh, you know, male, female pairs so that they don't get wiped out. So that was basically the works of the God of wisdom, Enki, um, Utu, uh, Inanna's brother, who's the sun God, and Inanna herself, who we know as Venus today, as the star of Venus. 
And I'll just give you a brief background on Inanna. She and her brother Utu, the sun god, are the daughter of Ningil and Nana. Uh, Nana is the moon god and Ningil is the moon goddess. So they were not in cahoots with the whole destruction of humanity and devised another plan. And this plan we know of is very comparable to the Noah's Ark in the Bible, the Christian Bible. Now, however, Inanna's story begins where we find that the sky god On and the air god Enlil have separated earth from heaven. There was the great separation there. And then we come to hear that Inanna in the story comes down during the time of the great flood when it's in the area of the Euphrates River, the floods are washing away all of the land and the waters and um, the south wind is rushing up, uh, assisting in, in the destruction. And Inanna comes down and plucks the lone cedar tree from the rushing waters, the raging waters. And she holds the tree and she cares for the tree. She takes the tree in her hands and she brings the tree to her holy garden. And there she really tends to the tree and loves the tree and protects the tree as it grows and grows. And years go by, two years, five years, 10 years, many years go by. And the tree now has become very stable foundation and even uh, producing fruit. So we have this aspect of fertility. And Inanna is sitting, uh, resting near her tree, enjoying the fruits of her labor or, or the, uh, of her work that she's done. And she's envisioning what she wants to manifest for her city, her city of Uruk. So she's creating this great vision that she has. And at that time, she is uh, uh, called, so she hears a call from her father or her grandfather, the god of wisdom, Enki. So she, as naturally we should all do when we hear a call, she beckons and goes to visit her father who he resides in Iridu, Anana's in Uruk. So she travels to Iridu and at the time, and I wanna read some of the actual poetic writing uh, at this point from her story that was, again, like I said, uh, it was translated by Samuel Noah Kramer and then Diane Wolkstein put a nice flair to the translations. Enki, the god of wisdom, who knows all things, knows that Inanna is coming to visit him. He tells his servant, when Inanna enters the holy shrine, Give her butter cake to eat, pour cold water to refresh her heart from her travels. Offer her beer before the statue of the lion. Treat her like an equal. Great Inanna, greet Inanna at the holy table, the table of heaven. And as this goes on, and Inanna then is there, and they share and drink beer together, they begin to drink more and more beer together with their bronze vessels filled to overflowing. With the vessels of Urish, mother of the earth, they toasted each other, they challenged each other. And Enki says, swaying with drink, in the name of my power, 
In the name of my holy shrine to my daughter, Inanna, I shall give the high priesthood, godship, the noble enduring crown, the throne of kingship. Inanna replied, I take them. And again, Enki raises his cup and toasts Inanna. In the name of my power, in the name of my holy shrine, to my daughter Inanna, I shall give truth, descent into the underworld, ascent from the underworld, the art of lovemaking, the, ho the holy priestess of heaven, the setting up of lamentations, the rejoicing of the heart, the giving of judgments, the making of decisions. Inanna replied, I take them. Fourteen times Enki raised his cup. Fourteen times Inanna accepted the Holy May. And the Holy May is uh, translated, or it's M-E, so I say it as May. But I see it as the tools of civilization or what was brought through these various interactions and um, given to Inanna to bring out uh, and to grow and, and transform her city-state of Uruk into what she had envisioned. And then there's a whole long list, uh, about 70 lines of different things that Enki is presenting to Inanna as the Holy May. And then after he enlists the whole, uh, many, many, many different things, and these are all, like I said, I can see that they really bring what we have and what we know today as civilization or society, as opposed to uh, the primitive and humans living in caves and having a much uh, smaller uh, circle and, and having much uh, less to work with as tools. And then also um, bringing in emotions and many, many different things. Like one of the things that really I, I noticed was truth. He's, he's giving her truth and lamentations, the setting up of lamentations and goes on to even talk about the drums and rituals, holy purification rites, the perceptive ear, the power of attention, uh, procreation, the assembled family, putting out a fire. So many things are listed. If you're interested in learning more, there's, uh, you could probably find it online nowadays. It's very easy to find these, these stories and myths. Now, what happens then is Enki falls asleep and Inanna goes on her way in her boat of heaven to her city. She, she takes off, uh, pushed off from the quay. And Enki awakens and the beer had gone out of the great God of wisdom at this point. And he says to his servant, my servant, where is the high priesthood, the godship? The noble enduring crown, where are they? The art of the hero, the art of power, treachery, deceit. Where are they? And his servant says, my king, you have given them to your daughter. So now Enki changes his mind. He wants to take the powers of civilization, the holy may back. So he sends his servant after Inanna as she's traveling down the quay onto her city and the quay of, in Uruk. However, Inanna has developed now the power to stand her ground and is not willing to return the Holy May once they were given to her. So a long series of uh, Enki continuing to try to recapture the Holy May from Inanna goes on and there's seven times and um, each time Inanna has a, a new way of uh, breaking the spell of Enki and, and making her power righteous in her 
and her uh, commitment to her city. So then, uh, and, and I, I and to my view, I think that um, really it's a test from Enki, much similar to how an elder shaman would test a young warrior. So this is, uh, you know, this is a symbolic way of identifying with that, but I think it stands true. And finally then, um, Enki gives up, we'll say, after seven times, and Enk at that point, Inanna is entering the holy quay, uh, uh, the, the, the lapis lazuli quay in her city of Uruk. And now they are unloading the powers of civilization, the holy may, from her boat of heaven. And interestingly, the uh, holy may now has multiplied. And there's more holy may that have been um, transformed as they're taking them off and they're announcing them um, in, in the city and, and there's a big celebration and all the people are there and it's, it's quite a event. So the, then I'll quote from the book here, uh, the Inanna, Queen of Heaven and Earth. Then more May appeared, more May than Enki had given Inanna, and these two were announced. Inanna brought the May, she brought the placing of the garment on the ground. She brought allure. She brought the art of women. She brought the perfect execution of the May. She brought the taigi and lily strums. She brought the ub, the meza, and the ella tambourines. And I see this as she bringing the aesthetics of humanity. Uh, we can think of Egypt and all of the gold and all of the artistic writings and just the... Um, the rich nature of aesthetics, but also similar to the nine muses, we have uh, all of the creativity and, and artistic ability that human beings have that's very different than the animal kingdom. So according to this, this was brought with the feminine power of Inanna. And Enki says to Inanna, in the name of my holy power, in the name of my holy shrine, let the may you have taken with you remain in the holy shrine of your city. Let the citizens of your city prosper. Let the children of Uruk rejoice. The people of Uruk are allies of the people of Iridu. Now, that's one piece of Inanna's story. And then we move into the courtship of Inanna, which comes about as Inanna and her brother, the sun god Utu, are discussing how to basically uh, work with the agricultural material that's being produced, the, the fertility of the land. Uh, for instance, the flax and linen and uh, wool, things like that. Well, then uh, Utu says, you know, basically, Inanna, you will have a courtship, and then your husband, King, will then produce and manifest all of the materials from this agricultural perspective, these uh, different things that we bring that bring uh, comfort to us as humans and, and much, much more pleasure as well. So uh, then we have this great love story, which is very, very similar to the Song of Songs we know of in the Christian Bible. And Samuel Noah Kramer, who is the Sumerian uh, scholar uh, and who devoted his whole life 
and who lifted Inanna to her proper reign in his various books and writing and translations, uh, definitely identifies the eccentricity, um, the richness, the sensuality of this, the poetic writing of the courtship of Inanna um, to the Song of Songs. And I, I don't feel like we have enough time for that, but it's, it's just really lovely and wonderful as well. And I'm sure if you're interested, you can look that up. Um, but what's excellent, I think, about this is that the words are so um, erotic and sensual, but yet they're all, it's all relating to agricultural aspects of uh, what we have. In, in our in our human or I mean in nature and our land and um, the beauty of our mother earth so I'll read a little bit um, let's see um, oh lady your breast is your field Inanna your breast is your field your broad field pours out plants your broad field pours out grain Water flows from on high for your, from your servant. Bread flows from on high for your servant. Pour it out for me, Inanna. I will drink all that you offer. And it continues to go on, and some of it uh, can be considered maybe X-rated, but um, it's very interesting and, like I said, very erotic uh, love song that, I, that Demuzi and Inanna sing to each other, it's very equal. They, they sing to each other. And Dumuzi, interestingly, has to uh, win Inanna's favor because originally she is after the farmer, but then he wins her favor and she accepts him and they go on then to uh, enter into the sacred marriage ritual. And the sacred marriage ritual for me isn't uh, I don't like the name, the title. I like to think of it as the sacred union or uh, the connection of the human with the divine. Um, and Demuzi is uh, her human counterpart. Inanna as the goddess, the deity, and Demuzi as the human counterpart. And then what's interesting is that this ritual then continues Every year, it's an annual New Year festival ritual that continues throughout the whole area of Mesopotamia, the city-state, as the New Year festival. And they are basically um, uh, bestowing the deities and the gods and asking for their favor and fertility and the continuing protection of the land. And then... Um, the king will then be given the blessing to have the sacred ritual and it is performed then with the high priestess. And like I said, then it's every year that they did this. And it ends up, uh, it marks the winter and summer seasons because that I, uh, Demuzi ends up um, having his own transformation. And I'm not going to go into that today, but I just wanted to point that out, how it relates to us even today, this sacred marriage or sacred union ritual. So now I want to move into the other significant point that Inanna brings in her story that is uh, very powerful and she's very much well noted for this of her journey to the underworld and it's um, at the end of her story uh, defining her almost as a, a human being. And um, then from there on where she is 
now given so much of um, tests or, you know, as a shaman would being given tests and trials, finally uh, she is able to come into her full power and is where she has her full reign. But let me tell you what the story of her journey to the underworld is about and how it, how it goes, how it unfolds. So after her and Demuzi have the sacred marriage ritual, then years go by and uh, Nana it gets restless and she's feeling maybe she's not getting uh, the same attention from Demuzi. So again, once again, she hears a call and she has no question of following through of this call and the call is is the ear and and we know this that we hear also sometimes being called to different um things in our life that we maybe think well i don't want to do that wait a minute let me think about this but inana does not hesitate and it's to go visit her sister, Erishkigal, who is the queen or goddess of the underworld. And Inanna goes on her way. She now, with her own holy servant, asks to have her servant just stand watch as she enters the underworld, just in case she doesn't return. Her. she's not afraid and she enters the underworld and the gatekeepers say why would you Inanna dare to enter the underworld with all of your powers and uh, uh, your your reign why would you now give all of this up to dare come and enter this dark space. And she believes that it has to do with uh, being a witness for her sister's husband's death. That's how the story is explained. And so she says that to the gatekeeper. And then he says, hold on, wait a minute, let me, let me, go right back, I'll be right back. And he goes and he speaks to Arishkagal. And Arishkagal finds this very interesting as well. Um, so she says, ha, huh, let's, she says, close all of the chambers and lock them. And at each gate or chamber, have I none or remove a part of her adornment because she comes fully adorned as if she's going to a celebratory ritual. So the gatekeeper does as he's told and each chamber or gate, Inanna must remove a part of her clothing. And I have a section that I highlighted that I just wanted to point out at the first gate from her head the shigera the crown of the step was removed the second gate the small lapis beads around her neck were removed at the third gate the breast the double strand at her breast the double strand of beads was removed at the fourth gate her breast plate was removed at the fourth, the fifth gate, the wrist, um, on her wrist was the gold ring was removed. The sixth gate, the lapis measuring rod and line was removed. And on, at the seventh gate, Inanna's royal robe was removed. So again, we have seven times Inanna must go through to enter. And at that point, then 
Inanna is standing before Arishkigal, the goddess of the underworld. Naked and bowed low, Inanna entered the throne room. Arishkigal rose from her throne and Inanna started toward her. And the, uh, the judges of the underworld, the Anuna, surrounded her. They passed judgment against Inanna. Arishkigal suddenly, at once, fastens the eye of death on Inanna. She spoke the word of wrath and uttered against her the cry of guilt. She struck her, and Inanna was turned into a corpse. And then Arishkigal hung her on a wooden peg left to rot. Now, fortunately, like I said, Inanna spoke to her servant and left her at the very first gate of the doors of the underworld and said, if I don't come back, she told her she knew what she needed her to do. She said, go to the gods and ask them to come to my aid. And her servant, Ninchigal, went. She went to the sky god on. And he said, I'm sorry. That's Inanna's fate and her doing. I'm not coming to her aid. She went to Enlil, the same. Finally, she comes to Enki, the god of wisdom. And once again, he does come to her aid and helps her in her return to the uh to the to earth and to the ascension that she's known for so she inanna returns from the underworld and she's one of the only deities goddesses that we know of that actually returns from the underworld and defies death and this, I believe, also contributed to her great reign and why she was so well known and um, so uh, much known in the balance of the opposites because most of her hymns are speaking of that, the balance of the opposites. And um, in the book, Inanna, Queen, and Hev Queen of Heaven and Earth, there are all of the uh, hymns that were sung to her over the hundreds of years of her reign. So now, I just wanted to give you that background and give you the intensity of Inanna from these different perspectives. But um, returning again to Enhejuana and her passion for Inanna um, and her deep, deep longing to have this connection to her and to please Inanna, because we can really see that in her exaltation as well. She's all pleasing and, and at the same time, she's giving every description possible of Inanna, which makes her all encompassing of darkness and light. She's the creator and destroyer. So we really um, can understand her from this perspective. And that then brings us to the awareness of this ideology of wholeness that we all can, uh, that we all have the capacity to, to, in, to um, in our life to just carry this aspect of wholeness the dark and the light and embracing all of this for our um, movement and transformation. And there's a lot more that, that can be said about that, but for at least this point, um, and then I'm gonna move into the second lecture with uh, mostly focusing on Anajuana and her hymns to Inanna and really, D, um, diving into the symbolism of that and expanding on that to get a more um, felt sense of what that was and how we can relate to it in our own lives today. 
So what I want to uh, leave you with in, in, in between now and December 12th and reconvening in this um, focus on Anejuana and Ainana, the goddess of Queen in Heaven and Earth, is one, thinking about yourself, how you've experienced a relationship with the beloved, your beloved, a lover and beloved relationship, and um, how you've experienced this and how it has identified with a deep longing for you in your life. Because I think longing is a primal uh, character. It's a primal part, it's a piece of who we are as humans. And I think it's something that's definitely missing in people, longing. And then also, from your perspective, how do you see the role of the feminine, whether it be energetically, whether it be aesthetically, whether it be uh, with the, um, the, the qualities um, of the feminine, you know, just the qualities of the feminine. And then um, thinking about like, how that has influenced the beginning of civilization. Civilization. What do you see from your perspective how the feminine has influenced the beginnings, the seedings of civilization? So that then now I'm going to close and open to questions. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn... Uh, as we normally do here uh, to some of the other faculty and we'll open it up to students. Uh, Will, why don't you go first today? Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Karen, for that uh, narrative. It was rich and, as usual and raised many questions for me. <clears throat> um, I was thinking about this question what is the role of the landscape of Ur in the birthing of this narrative? And the reason I think about that is this was uh, 2300 uh, BCE and Gemini and others were in this area at Gobekli Tepe, which was about 8,000 years before this story. And then we have this wonderful ornate story. And then after that, we have this same landscape birthing Abraham. So that's a question. Another question and deeply related to our situation we have now is, is the gift to Inanna from Enki, her father, the powers of civilization? So then that raises the question that I am, for one, asking right now, what is civilization? Mm. And if you, look, if you look that up, for example, uh, nearly any definition is a civilization, according to uh, uh, most standard uh, explorations, is a relatively high level of cultural and technological development specifically related to writing and keeping written records. Mm. Wow. I think it might be a lot more than that. So I, <laughs> I, I, I just uh, I just raise that question for myself that that we we just completed an incredible exploration in September on the co-creation of a new civilization, and I'm aware 
that in that marvelous exploration, we didn't ask the question, what is civilization? Mm. So in some ways, this story is addressing that question. And I, I personally want to look into that a bit more. Excellent. Yes. Uh, I think that is a great question. And I've thought about it too. And in my thinking about it, I have to compare it to how human beings were before we became civilized, we could say, or became a society, or had numerous uh, material formations um, that bring comfort. And then the other piece that I find interesting that relates to Inanna's story is in her hymns and, uh, and her praising and keeping in mind that she was, she was invested in humanity. She was not of the plan to destroy all living beings and start over. She wanted to work with human beings, nature, as it was created. And then um, allowing for the aspect of pleasure, because if you consider the fact that, um, think of, of gods and goddesses and deities, they don't necessarily have the same um, feeling of sensuality and then also um, the pleasure even just of food, tasting food or um, feeling the sense of comfort or, or being um, in the realm of other beings uh, and, and everything, being able to see, touch and smell, right? This is what we have as human beings, also animal kingdom, but we are set apart from that as well. So go back to the, to the um, prehistoric and uh, the time when we didn't have the same comforts and the tools and all the things that we need and recording of transactions and, and transacting, right? So I think um, in agricultural um, aspects, trading, but in her hymns, we know that she wanted to keep the keep alive the um, darker aspects that maybe people now want to keep tame. That want to be tamed. So I see being civilized as being tame, <laughs> whereas. Um, no, it doesn't happen <laughs> because we're human beings, right? So people go out and get raucous and, you know, do all their crazy things that they want to do, um, which is whether it be um, late night, you know, clubs or whether it be um, sexual interludes that maybe wouldn't be accepted in our every main, everyday mainstream ideology. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to jump off, but maybe we'll pick this up next time because I, I actually think it's the opposite, that civilization, okay. civilization is the ability to balance the wild with the tame. I'll, I'll leave that. Mm. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Will. Thank you Thank so you. much. You bet. By the way, before we uh, uh, turn it over to Mark for his comment, it's worth noting that Sumer, uh, which historians consider the earliest civilization, uh, with the possible exception of, of the civilization that grew up independent of Sumer in the Yangtze River Valley in China, is considered probably the most fertilely creative time in human history. Um, there's a book 
I forget the title of it now, that, that counts over 60 continuously used instruments and forms, so social forms that originated in Sumer. Let's just take, for example, writing. You know, we're the only species that writes. All species communicate. But it's the capacity of humans to engage in writing mm. that allows humans to pass a communication down over time. Without writing, in Hedjuana's works, would not be discussed today. And so that's why um, historians consider writing as one of the three or four core aspects of civilization because large amounts of people cannot aggregate together cohesively without law. Law can't maintain itself over time without writing. And it's, it's, so it's, these, are, these are very complex uh, issues that go into civilization. So I just wanted to flag that, Karen, because I, I hope we can return to Will's question, actually, what is civilization? Uh, uh, possibly next time when, when he can rejoin us. Um, but uh, in any case, Mark, why don't you go on? And then I'm very eager to turn it over to the students in particular. I want to bring uh, Farnak on, who has um, a workshop on Inanna that's going to be happening uh, in a couple weeks' time. But Mark, why don't you make a comment uh, before we turn it over to the students? Sure, Jim. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much, Karen. I was, um, I'd like to return to the... Um, very beginning of your remarks and raise some um, look at their implications for education for and the kind of education that can be offered through the wisdom school. The uh, as a certified holotropic breath worker, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that all of this was kicked off for you with that experience of uh, the, the breath work. Mm -hmm. And as you noted, in that work, the aim is to attain some other state of consciousness than the state we are normally in. I, mm. I, I love to quote um, William James on this. He says, he says, our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness. Was all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of streams and by other forms of consciousness entirely different. We may go through life without suspecting their existence, but apply the requ requisite stimulus, and at a touch, they are there in all their completeness, definite types of mentality that probably somehow have their fields of application and adaptation. And wow, did that have a field of application and adaptation for Karen Castle, right? This yes. initiated um, uh, stepping into some other state of consciousness initiated a tremendous opening to you and an educational process so far beyond what most of our edu uh, education does, which is really designed to um, keep us within the confines of our normal waking consci consciousness, uh, uh, keep us in the confines of that rational world. So it seems to me that um, one of the basic missions of a place like wisdom is to offer the opportunity to conceive of education as something that, yes, hones that rational state of mind beautifully, as you have done with all your subsequent work on um, Sumer and Inanna and um, the subject of, of, of what you're giving us today. But it's, um, you have done that, but, but this has, 
the wisdom school has given you the opportunity to also exploit the insights you bring from that other state of consciousness. And I think there, there are many ways in which uh, we can and should be doing that, such as, for example, um, um, we, we, introducing various ways of entering those other states, breath work being one, but only one. And there, there are many others. And we've yes. um, tried to do that in some of our courses, but, and it's uh, a little more difficult online. <laughs> but yes. but it's, um, it's something that I think uh, your, your beautiful narration of your own experience evolving out of that non-ordinary state and into the refinements of rational culture, I think is great food for thought for how uh, the wisdom school might approach uh, education. So I'll stop with that remark. Thank you. And I'd be interested in any comments you might have about that, Karen, from your own. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, one of the, what you just said actually brought me to what we want to think of as wholeness. As I was saying before, this uh, ideology of wholeness that I believe Ainana encapsulates because she brings together the balance of the light and dark energies so that we can understand it's a part of all of who we are. This is a part of all of who we are. And incidentally then, holotropic, H-O-L-O, -O, tropic, as you know, Mark, means moving towards wholeness. So that's just a little bit on what you just said. And then I also wanna add, and this is something that I wanted to mention, that me sharing that story, that personal experience, is not only to give you an uh, idea of why this is so powerful and important and a privilege for me to present on Inanna and, and Juana, but also that it's relatable to many people. Women, I hear often when, more, when I'm speaking with women about the goddess, the, the goddess will come to them in some dreamlike state. It's organic, but it's, it's, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. um, men as well. I've, um, in my studies in um, transpersonal psychology, I came across men who also had these experiences. Very organic. It can be, obviously, through the holotropic breathwork we've created, or Dr. Stan Groff has created that ritual, um, that is still today very popular and throughout the world. And uh, yet um, it doesn't need to be that, like you said, it can be a matter of opening our ear, right? Like the call, the call that Inanna hears, she hears this inside, innately. It's organic, but she listens without hesitation. And this also is very important because uh, contrary to Will, I think that we're a little too civilized these days. And um, if, we, if we remove some of the blockages that keep us from really following our true path or fulfilling our life purpose and just fulfillment in general, then many people would live a different life for sure. And then um, there was something I was just thinking, I want to go back the, about the breath work. Oh, that, and this is just sort of a fun note when I, cause I still uh, hold the space for the holotropic breath work regularly. I've been for, I think it's been 12, 13 years now. And I'm always surprised by people's experiences. I've never, I haven't become numb to it at all. I'm always fascinated. But I always tell people because uh, nobody has ever experienced or done this work before, people are so tense and shielded and, you know, on guard about opening up to this ethereal space and having uh, some sort of experience, whatever state of consciousness it is, opening 
to that. So I tell them, let's just get uncivilized. <laughs> Or try to be uncivilized, or it's like being, un and so anyway, it was sort of fun. But. Interestingly enough, I heard Stan Groff at one of his workshops make the comment, we're not civilized here. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, let's uh, open it up uh, to some of the, the students. Uh, so if you... Uh, have something you'd like to say, raise your hand. I see Farinak. So Farinak, why don't you come on and uh, tell us what you have planned and maybe put any question or comment you would like. Farinak, by the way, is one of our new doctoral students. So I want to welcome you, Farinak. We first met Farinak and Chartra uh, last year. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Karen. Hi, Hello. thank you, Jim. Good to see you again. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We, uh, Farinak and I just met on Saturday. We, we met for quite some time and, and spoke on Inanna, so that was lovely. Yeah, yeah. fantastic, Great. fantastic. Yeah, um, I, I was uh, just pondering and I've been That's reading all your the pilgrimage. Yes, yes, the pilgrimage with the women, although it's going to be much shorter, you know. Uh, we only have half an hour, 40 minutes maybe for the whole journey, um, the storytelling. But uh, I was wondering, like reading uh, in the myth of the goddess as well and all the other books that are arriving on Inanna, like I mean, flooded with Inanna. <laughs> um, uh, she, for me, what I'm understanding that she was kind of the last or maybe the first and the last goddess that really embodied you know what you say the wholeness but so many aspects of the feminine in one it's like before she got scattered the goddess literally got fragmented into first little pieces and then many many pieces whereas in in the you know last what we know you've got the pure virgin mary and and then the, the mm. prostitute which is the magdalene and then the black madonna and all of these aspects of the goddess have been kind of fragmented into different personas almost of the goddess. And it feels like Inanna was the, the first and the last one that embodied a certain variety and multiplicity of creation that that's for me most fascinating at this moment. And did she or did she not, was she the goddess that actually was in the transition of patriarchy? Like, because when did her descent really come? Because the descent is actually the first fragmentation, you could say, of um, that she had to go to the underworld to retrieve a part of her. Before that, I believe none of the great mother figures had to make a descent to become whole again. Is that, that's what I'm wondering. Is she the first that had to make a descent to retrieve herself? Well, I can't say for certain that she is the first, but it seems that she is. And that she um, integrates that part of herself through the journey to the underworld. Because if you think of Arishkagal, her sister, it could be her mirror. And yeah. this is something that I've used in my life uh, for me to, you know, when you see somebody else as um, having a lot of dark aspects or, or, or negative energy, and then you can look and say, okay, well, actually, what is that about me? that I'm seeing, right? This is um, some, some work that we can do for growth to uh, learn more about ourselves. But um, for Inanna, I would say that definitely um, she was, if not the, the only and the first goddess to journey to the underworld to um, bring that piece together as part of her life story, she was the only and um, goddess known to defy death, to return from the underworld. Yeah. 
Yeah, and um, and that's also represented in her hymns that were sung to her over her period of reign. And that's very significant for our life uh, the, and, and civilization of how we see all of that, how we see the light and the darkness and different things in our, in our lens of our life. Yeah. Well, it's still like this, this, there's, there's this fragment of this question in remains in me. It's like, is, is, is it the first uh, feminine deity or feminine form? Is it the first time the goddess, the feminine energy has experienced the um the masculine principle of well you know cutting and separation which was necessary for our human evolution to come into consciousness from the unconscious uroboros you know state of unity but it would be quite significant if she was the first female deity that would reflect that original cutting um Yes. Okay. So you're, you're, and I meant to bring this up, but the, but Isis also has this, but it's through her, her lover, right? So Isis has the cutting up and yeah. uh, somebody please tell me of Isis and the story of um, Osiris. Osiris. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So that is a, another yeah, representation. Later though, right? She was after the Sumerian. Uh, I tried to really decipher the time frame, and it's very, very close. Is it? Okay. okay. Yeah, the Egyptian uh, deities and goddesses are, it, it's right around all of the same couple hundreds of years. Okay. Okay, good to know. And, and the last comment is that it's interesting that the god of wisdom is the one that saves her, which is in all mythologies that, that the wisdom, usually it's more the feminine aspect of wisdom, but it's wisdom that answers yeah. all. I thought that was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So he was also for the balancing of the opposites. And there's a, even a long story of the god of wisdom where he has to fight uh, the, the, god of the, the goddess of the sea, and then, um, you know, has his own a trial and challenge and test to come to his reign and then become goddess of wisdom. So he has a big challenge that he goes through as well. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. You. Let, let me just uh, briefly comment, and then I think we'll go to Yulia Antonova uh, for a second. But I think that the impulse of your question, Farnak, is essentially uh, correct in the sense that Inanna emerged out of Sumer, and Sumer was the first civilization, the first imperial tradition and then was fractalized into Aphrodite in Greece, Ishtar, uh, and, and even Isis, who were within the same general period. But I think your, your intuition that Inanna was as close to the bedrock of that first feminine goddess who emerged within a purely patriarchal social structure, you can see as she gets refracted into the later goddesses in the different cultures of Greece and Egypt and Babylonia, et cetera, um, uh, how the totality that was Inanna um, was in fact fractalized in many, many different um, forms. Mm. And some of the goddesses took some of her aspects into a more refined state or more extreme state. For example, Ishtar was uh, far more warlike, for example, than Inanna. Um, although Inanna was the goddess of war because Sargon um, took her as his emblem and she was the goddess of Uruk. So um, it's a lot of, of complexities and a lot of unknowns, obviously, but 
Mm -hmm. I just wanted to appreciate your question because it's, it's getting to, when you get to Inanna, as Karen knows, you're getting pretty close to the bedrock. And um, then before that, of course, is the mother goddess, um, long before the emergence of patriarchy. Uh, uh, but um, uh, she's one of the foundational goddesses. So, Yulia, uh, how are you? Welcome to our call. Uh, greetings, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. The sound is good. Uh, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, so, uh, when I started reading about the Inanna, and thank you, Karen, for that great uh, book, uh, I, was, I started wondering, and as I did with all of the great books, I always think about them through the, through the Jungian perspective, actually, mm. through the perspective of archetypes. Hmm. And I was started about when I was reading about Inanna, I was thinking about, and just the word that Jim just said us is a bedrock. So is the hmm. Inanna, that bedrock archetype of Jung, like in terms of Jung archetypes, the archetype of love or the feminine power that has to go through the quest or a journey actually. So She's like, uh, for me, she, I parallel Inanna uh, with Antigone of Sophocles. As Antigone is also as a feminine power, and she's the um, Im image of love, of youth, of beauty. And Antigone ha went through a journey given by Creon. And Inanna is going through a journey given all the... Um, mediums of power by her father uh, as well. So there are so many uh, archetypes that we face in different religions, in different great books that we should think of. And I'm really curious, like what other archetypes will we find when exploring the life of Inanna? Because I think as she's one of the first goddess, she's one of the first famous images of feminine so she will probably bring us more archetypes that we will be surprised of. Yes, I agree. I would definitely say that is true. And that is what I focused on in not only my first book, but definitely in my second book, uh, because I wanted to really highlight well, in my books, I use Dr. Jung's uh, theories throughout both of them because it really struck me how they did. They were so synchronistic and uh, very much consistent with Inanna's story. So the archetypes are, there's a plethora from her myth, from the symbolism of her myth. And it's interesting when you dive in and you look at it that way, that um, even with the masculine aspects and identifying those masculine aspects within, right? Not out there, but within and taking a look at how that plays out in your life. Also, uh, Rishkagal. You know, I, I gave a very surface uh, brief on Inanna's story because it can go on and I can, yeah, I can go into that much further in depth. But um, Arishka Gal is something that we also can look at as an archetype and identify, like I was saying to Farinak, as a way of growing and, and understanding more about ourselves. So a uh, huge plethora of archetypes that come from Inanna's myth. And as Jim said, she's also like an origin goddess because from her, uh, as the Sumerian culture presenting her, um, we can see uh, all this, like a string of beads, all of these other goddesses that come from her story and have the similar qualities, um, whether they be the you know, sexual sense or the beauty sense or the warrior-like sense, 
um, the strength, um, holding, you know, a particular place uh, uh, or in, in the city state or a role um, in the pantheon, pantheon of different deities in each culture, like in the Greek culture with Athena. Yes, definitely. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you too. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Uh, there's several more people and we're running a little bit short of time, but I, I'll go to Rod Chambers, who uh, I, I uh, think may be talking to us from China. Hey, Rod. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Appreciate you caring. I really appreciate you sharing. There was definitely a lot that I'm I'm gathering as you're speaking and as everyone is contributing. Um, I'll I'll keep it as brief as I can. I'll just say from a different perspective. I was really curious in the educational experiences of Ed Hanana. Is that how you pronounce the name? Ainana or Ed Hanana. Ediwana. Yeah. I still probably didn't say it correctly. But I'm, I'm really curious about the educational institutions and how she was able to hone her skill as a writer, because I think it's easy for me when I read ancient texts that I take it for granted that people just wrote and they were skilled to write. And when you think about poetry, you think about music, and you think about the liturgical kinds of writing that she's doing, that it takes a level of skill to be able to do that. So I'm, I'm just, I'll just throw the question to the atmosphere about just that educational component, that there was some kind of institution, or maybe there wasn't, I don't know. But I'm, I'm curious about that particular experience for her. Uh, well, Jimmy may want to say something as well, but uh, I, I think that I, what comes to mind is the culture of India and w women who are um, in a family that are well-to-do and they are raised learning the varying muses, basically, but music, writing, dance, singing, um, maybe even play. Uh, playing or actress, you know, playing in a play. And uh, so they get this very early on and it could very well have been that way for, from the um, Sumerian culture and how it began. She was the daughter of the king, so she yeah. would naturally have all the, those amenities available to her. Hey, let and me, it's like cuneiform, by the way, it's cuneiform writing. And I tried to learn cuneiform writing, and it was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I really tried. <laughs> this is a great question, uh, Rod, and we'll, we'll close with this. Um, but just think about it, everyone, for a minute. Um, human beings, according to anthropologists, have been as intelligent as we are on this call for about 150,000 years. Just think about that for a second. Same emotions, same IQ, same brain size. And we went till about 5,000 years ago just talking to one another. And then in Sumer, somebody said, wait a minute, we can do more than just talk if we, if we put these little widgets, these little alphabet, letters of an alphabet together, we can start an abstraction that will endure over time. So people should just take in, and Hedjuana was probably one of the first people ever to write anything. Just think about that for a moment like the first person to go to the moon. And just think of the excitement that this woman had. And first of all, you're in the emergence of patriarchy and this is the woman who knew how to write. I am sure, 
And Hedjuana was an inordinate genius. And this is another piece of, of just so that we're thinking of the brilliance of these people. You know, in ancient Greece, there was no writing at all until about 800 BC. And the first book written was the Iliad and the Odyssey, the greatest work of genius in all of Greek literature and one of the greatest works of genius in all of human literature. And you have in Hedjuana, 2300 BC, 1500 years before Homer, being one of the first human beings to ever write <laughs> what we take for granted. And she came out with a work of genius. And it was such a work of genius, as Karen said, the Bible in the Song of Solomon's was a copy of what in Hedjuana and the other Enuma Elish and some of the other stories that that were already ancient at the time of Enhejuana, but for the first time in history were being written down. And so when we talk about the genius of Sumer, and remember that writing was only one of about 60 contributions that that civilization made to what it means to be civilized. So your question, Rod, is really a, an extraordinary question. And, and it's just, just worth for us, you know, at the beginning of the 21st century to pause and appreciate in Hedjuana and all of what she brought available to humanity simply because she had the, the, the good sense to write it all down. And she became, by the way, an instant celebrity and was attributed semi-divine status after she died. And uh, her works, people at that time recognized her genius and saved them. And th that endured over time and now lives for all of us in the present day. So I'm, I'm, I can't tell so you how much. Just, let me just add, please, please, to that. What makes it even more exciting than what you're saying is that Inanna wrote about her human emotion, the devotion that she had to her deity, Inanna, and she's emitting all of this uh, She's, she's expressing this really deep connection to the divine. Uh, and it's all encompassing. So when we go with that next time on December 12th, that's where we're going to get into all that. So it's a perfect segue. But, but to have that recording recorded in writing yep. is so precious. It's just, yeah. it's, it's amazing, it's beautiful, it really is. So Karen, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank uh, you, everyone, uh, thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll all uh, come again on the 12th of December. And in the meantime, don't forget to go on the uh, Facebook page, uh, which should be available to write any comments you might have. And so we'll sign off now, but uh, uh, Dr. Castle, thank you very much. We'll see you all next time. Okay. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Blessings.